Hi everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay and we're uh, coming through loud and clear on your computers and uh, for those of you having trouble with the audio on your computers, please feel free to switch to phone audio and call into the number that appears uh, on the right hand toolbar of your screen. Uh, with that being said, uh, welcome. This is the Consumer Product Safety Commission's webinar series. The topic today is carriages and strollers. My name is Shelby Mathis. I'm the Small Business Ombudsman at the CPSC, and uh, we're happy to have you. I wanted to just do two kind of housekeeping things first uh, before we get started, and one is to introduce you to the toolbar that appears on the right-hand side of your screen. If you're not familiar with GoToWebinar uh, and the way that it works, uh, on the right hand side of your screen, you have a few things that you can do throughout the webinar. One is to ask a question. There is no need to raise your hand. Uh, I've got a colleague here, Will, that is, uh, will be taking questions throughout the webinar uh, because I'm going to be going through the slides. I won't be able to answer directly. But as you think of a question, feel free to submit it uh, and you can do that with the toolbar on the right. Also available on the toolbar on the right is a handout, which is a PDF of the slides today. As I go through the slides, you're going to see uh, what appear to be hyperlinks. You're not going to be able to click on them because you're looking at an image of my screen. But once you download the PDF of the slides, those do have live hyperlinks that you're able to click on. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, a quick disclaimer, I am a CPSC staff member. We are an agency that is headed by a commission, so the views expressed today are my own and may not necessarily reflect the views of the commission. So an agenda for today. Uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to define what a carriage and a stroller is, and we're going to take that straight from the regulation and the mandatory standard, the ASTM standard that defines carriages and strollers. And I'll give you a little history of the rule because that is a question that we get somewhat frequently in our office. Then we'll move to the labeling and instructional literature requirements that apply to carriages and strollers. And uh, we'll touch on the product registration requirement, and I'll highlight some resources there because, again, that's another topic uh, of questions that we receive in the SBO office. I'll go through the testing requirements, and these have been broken into chemical and then physical and mechanical testing. Uh, and we'll walk through those uh, as best we can. Uh, we are going to be limited on time today, so I'm going to do my best to uh, give you as much in depth on the testing requirements as I can um, and just let you know what exists in the standard. I'll highlight some product hazards for those of you that are looking to import a stroller, you're designing a new stroller, uh, or you might be um, you know, reconfiguring an existing one or making a design change to an existing one. These are some product hazards to look out for that have historically tripped up uh, manufacturers of carriages and strollers. I'll talk about the children's product certificate requirement, including walking through the seven sections and um, what they could look like in a hypothetical situation for a stroller or carriage. I'll highlight two recall examples and uh, touch on business resources that are available here through the CPSC that I think uh, you guys will find useful. And then we'll do a Q&A session at the end. So if you wanna just submit your questions as I move through the material, uh, I'll do my best to answer as many as I can in the time that we've got at the end of today's session. All right, so first let's start with a little bit of history about the carriages and stroller standard. Uh, this all began with a notice of proposed rulemaking on May the 20th of 2013. There is a previous carriages and stroller standard that is actually uh, incorporating a, or incorporated ASTM F833-13B with a modification to address head entrapment hazards associated with multi-positional or adjustable grab bars. And the previous standard, that ASTM F833-13B, applies to products manufactured beginning on September the 10th of 2015 through October the 1st of 2016. Now the current standard, and this is the one we're talking about today, uh, is 16 CFR Part 1227. It incorporates ASTM F833-15 without modification. The effective date of the current carriage and stroller standard is October the 2nd of 2016, so a little over a year ago. This became effective uh, on products manufactured on or after that October 2nd date. So let's define what a carriage is and what a stroller is and uh, so that we can distinguish between those two products. The carriage definition comes straight from ASTM F833-15 and it is a wheeled vehicle generally used for the transport of an infant who is generally in a lying down position. 
The motive power is supplied by a person or persons pushing or pulling on a handle attached to the vehicle. A carriage may be capable of being folded for storage. Now contrast a stroller definition, also again from the ASTM 83315 standard. A, a stroller is a wheeled vehicle for the transport of infants or children, generally in a sitting up or semi-reclined position. The motive power is supplied by a person moving at a walking rate while pushing on a handle attached to the stroller. A stroller generally is capable of being folded for storage. Strollers normally are used for children from infancy to 36 months of age. So let's compare and contrast these two definitions. You'll see with carriage, I've actually bolded and underlined that they are mainly for the transport of an infant and generally in a lying down position. Contrasted with a stroller, which is generally for transporting a child from infancy to 36 months of age, and the occupant of a stroller is generally in a sitting up or semi-reclined position. And I always find that the easiest way to understand what product category something falls into is to take a look at some examples. And before I go through these, I've got to do a quick disclaimer, which is that I'm providing these photos for illustration purposes only, and it's not meant as an endorsement of any of the products shown. So let's start on the top left. We've got a full-size 2D stroller that you see actually collapses on itself. Um, next to it is a 3D umbrella stroller that uh, collapses basically just like an umbrella, hence the term. Uh, then we have a travel system, which is a car seat that is snapped into a frame uh, that's a stroller system. Then we have a carriage, which uh, is essentially a pram that's appearing on the right-hand side, at the top right of your screen. On the bottom line, we've got a tandem stroller. That one holds three occupants. Next to it, a side-by-side -side stroller holding two occupants. Next to that, a multi-occupant stroller that can hold, looks like, six to eight occupants. And then lastly, a jogging stroller on the bottom right. Every single one of these photos that appears on your screen or these images uh, would fall under the carriages and stroller standard that we're going to go through today. All right, we're going to start out um, first off with tracking information because this is something that uh, can trip people up. And um, frankly, it's an easy topic to kind of work our way into um, this relatively complex standard. So uh, tracking information. There is a section of the ASTM F83315 that deals with marking and labeling. And it states the following. Marking and labeling needs to be permanently on the product and its packaging. Included in that uh, labeling needs to be manufacturer, distributor, or seller name, and a place of business, which means city, state, mailing address, including zip code, and a telephone number. And that's per our regulation, 16 CFR 1130.4. Also required permanently on the product and the packaging are a code or mark that identifies the date of manufacture, and that means month and year of manufacture in this case and a batch or a run number if the manufacturer is using batches or runs. And that actually doesn't come from the ASTM standard. It comes from the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act tracking information requirement. Uh, and if you have questions on tracking information and what the requirements are there, we do have a nice frequently asked questions website about the tracking label requirement or tracking information requirement from CPSIA. And it appears as hyperlinks on your screen, but again, you can't click on them. You have to get those from the handout section on the right hand side of your toolbar and download the PDF of these slides to get the hyperlink straight to that frequently asked question site, which is a, is a very useful resource and may actually have your question uh, on it that you have about tracking labels. All right, let's get into labeling requirements because they are pretty extensive. Uh, first off, before I start, I do want to say um, I show the triangle um, with the exclamation point in yellow. Uh, that needs to appear with each warning. I rather than put it all over this slide, I just stuck it one time on the slide. So I don't want to confuse anybody there, but um, that is the symbol for warning. So um, labels need to be permanently on the product and the packaging. and we, all strollers and carriages need to state, warning, never leave a child unattended. For products that are manufactured with a restraint system, they need the following warning permanently on the product and packaging. Warning, avoid serious injury from falling or sliding out. Always use seat belt or a manufacturer has the ability to insert other words to describe their restraint system. And we'll talk about requirements on a restraint system uh, a little bit later in the webinar today. For products with a reclined carriage position, 
they need to state warning, child may slip into leg openings and strangle. Never use in reclined carriage positions unless, and here the manufacturer has the ability to insert product specific instructions. Uh, a note, this um, is not required on units that do not have openings or that automatically reduce the size of openings. So if you're making a reclined carriage that doesn't have openings or those openings automatically reduce in size, you would not need to post this warning. Uh, products with removable wheel fork assemblies or three-wheeled strollers with a locking front swivel wheel have additional warning requirements. So let's talk about instructional literature requirements. And again, this is coming straight from ASTM F83315. Uh, instructional literature may be on the package or included in leaflet form with the carriage or stroller. The instructions need to be easy to read and understand, and they need to be in English. And they need to include assembly, how to maintain the product, how to clean the product, and then how to operate it, including how to fold it. Uh, we showed the examples of the 2D and 3D folding uh, strollers, information on how to operate that folding mechanism needs to be included in the literature. The instructions must also state the maximum weight of the intended user of the product. Uh, more instructional literature requirements. Uh, the, the first one applies to units manufactured with a restraint system. Uh, you need to include instructions describing the use of the restraint system and including the following warning. Avoid serious injury from falling or sliding out. Always use seat belt or a manufacturer may insert additional words here to describe their restraint system. For convertible carriage or strollers requiring manual operation to comply with occupant retention requirements, they need to include the following warning. Warning, child may slip into leg openings and strangle. Never use in reclined carriage positions unless, and here the manufacturer needs to insert product specific instructions. Uh, more instructions uh, that need to include, be included on products. Uh, products with a removable fork assembly need to describe the proper assembly and maintenance procedures for these mechanisms. And then those products supplied with package carrying accessories that come with the original equipment, meaning the stroller or carriage comes with package carrying accessories. Uh, there needs to be instructions on the maximum weight recommended and uh, you also need to warn the user that excessive weight may cause a hazardous, unstable condi condition to exist. Products that are not supplied um, with package carrying accessories, so these would be carriages or strollers that are sold without a package carrying accessory, need to warn that unstable hazardous conditions may exist if these accessories are added onto the product after the fact. So on the product registration requirement, uh, this is something that applies to all manufacturers of durable infant or toddler products. And strollers and carriages absolutely fall into the category of durable infant or toddler products. Um, but a product registration form must be attached to the product per our regulation, 16 CFR part 1130. And that registration card needs to provide consumers with a postage uh, pre-postage paid product registration card, and manufacturers uh, need to maintain records of the names, addresses, emails, and other contact info on consumers that register their products. There also needs to be uh, a permanently placed manufacturer name and contact info, model name and number, and date of manufacture on each durable product because it's referenced in the product registration card form and in the registration form itself. The whole reason for this product registration requirement under our Reg 1130 is to improve overall recall effectiveness and to help manufacturers provide safety alert warnings to consumers more effectively. On the bottom right hand side of your screen, you see a product registration for safety alert or recall only uh, block with some text underneath it. The good news is, is that our Reg 1130 actually includes two figures at the end of it and there's a uh, hyperlink to that information on our product registration card FAQ site, which again appears on your screen and is an active hyperlink in the PDF handout um, available on through your toolbar on the right hand side of this webinar. Uh, the good news is at the end of 1130, there are two figures that are actually the front and back of that registration card. So to the extent that you just wanna copy those and send them out to print, you absolutely can do that. Uh, you just need to make sure that you update your website address because you'll see it references a www.website.com. You'll need to put your website information there.
but another good resource and registration cards is that FAQ site. There's a pretty extensive list of questions uh, and answers from uh, our internal staff on how to handle different situations associated with a registration card. All right, let's get into uh, the testing requirements. And we will start with the chemical ones first. Uh, on all children's products, lead content testing applies. And this is per 15 USC 1278A. The limit there is 100 ppm in any accessible parts of children's products. Certainly a stroller or carriage uh, is a children's product, so 100 ppm lead limit applies. Uh, I did want to point out that there's a whole list of materials that we know are not going to exceed that lead limit as long as they're in an untreated, unadulterated state. Uh, and this list of materials comes from our regulation 16 CFR 1500.91, which is hyperlinked in your handout. Uh, I've I've selected some materials here um, that are part of 1500.91, but it's a pretty extensive list. So if you don't see a material that might be included in your carriage or stroller here, uh, you'll want to follow the link and actually take a look at the reg uh, and see what's included. But materials that do not exceed the lead limit that are shown on your screen would be wood and paper products, CMYK process printing inks that fully absorb into the substrate, natural fibers, both dyed and undyed, that include the long list that appears right there. And there's even more. I just highlighted a few there. Uh, and manufactured fibers, both dyed and undyed, including but not limited to that list that appears at the bottom of your screen. So what does this 1500.91 actually mean? Uh, it means that uh, these materials in untreated, unadulterated states that appear on any children's product, including a carriage or stroller, uh, would not require testing for lead content uh, as long as they were completely comprised of things that are in 1500.91. So it is um, a list that um, not everybody is aware of, but something I did want to point out. All right, moving on to more chemical testing requirements on uh, strollers and carriages. Uh, lead in paint and similar surface coatings testing is from our regulation 16 CFR 1303. The limit there is no more than 90 ppm in those uh, paints and surface coatings. And this uh, we routinely see in things like screen printing uh, or surface printing that doesn't absorb into uh, a material itself and sits on the uh, surface. Certainly uh, painted uh, metal parts would also fall under this lead and paint testing in the 90 ppm limit. Additionally, phthalates, which are plasticizers, uh, require testing under 15 U.S.C. 2057C. But one thing I want to point out here uh, is that this applies to carriages and strollers that contain plasticized parts that are designed, marketed, or intended to facilitate sleep. So we're talking about carriages or reclining strollers or to facilitate eating. So this would be like a stroller with a food tray. Uh, this would apply to uh, those sorts of carriages and strollers. Uh, and in the case of phthalates, uh, there is a permanent ban on three phthalates that are listed on your screen that cannot exceed 0.1% uh, each in their limit. Additionally, there is a temporary ban on three other phthalates that are listed on your screen that also cannot exceed 0.1% uh, in each of their quantities. Uh, something I wanted to point out about phthalates, because uh, we have been getting some questions here since there's been some uh, activity from our agency related to phthalates, is that there's a recent determination by the CPSC regarding certain plastics, and this is under our Reg 16 CFR Part 1308. The effective date is September the 29th, 2017, and uh, what this regulation did is it actually removed seven plastics from requiring independent third-party testing for compliance with phthalates prohibitions. And the seven plastics are actually listed on your screen. So um, there are PP, PE, HIPS, ABS, GPPS, MIPS, and SHIPS. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, it means that if you are a manufacturer or importer of a carriage or stroller that either uh, is intended, marketed, or designed to facilitate sleeping, so we used as examples the reclining uh, strollers or a carriage, uh, or it facilitates eating or feeding, so there's a, a food tray. If that food tray uh, or parts of your stroller are plastic, and the plastics that your carriage or stroller is made of 
are completely contained, you know, com uh, completely comprised of any combination of the seven plastics that are listed on your screen, then you would not need to conduct phthalates testing on those plastics. So let's move on to physical and mechanical testing requirements for carriages and strollers, and we'll start out with small parts. Uh, small parts are defined in our regulation, 16 CFR Part 1501, and a small part fits entirely into a small part cylinder as specified in the regulation. We do have a small parts uh, business education page available on cpsc.gov, which is a pretty good resource. Uh, and for those of you that are very familiar with the workings of uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, you've probably seen a lot of us with the cylinders sitting on our desk. Um, so we, we know quite well what a small part is. Um, for carriages and strollers, because they are a product that's primarily intended for use by a child under three, um, there can be no small parts included with the stroller, the stroller or the carriage um, before testing, and no small parts can be liberated during testing. Um, once we get into the physical and mechanical testing, you're going to see um, how in-depth that actually is. So during that use and abuse testing or physical and mechanical testing on the strollers and carriages, um, the, the products can't produce any small parts during the testing process either. Uh, for those of you making products that might have exposed wood parts, you need to make sure that those are smooth and free of splinters and that there are no hazardous sharp points or edges as defined by our regs 1500.48 and 1500.49. Uh, and I just wanted to point out for sharp points and edges, that applies just like small parts. There can't be sharp points or edges before testing and there can't be sharp points or edges after testing. Uh, for products that might contain an exposed coil spring or any kind of exposed coils, um, that might be accessible to the occupant. Those need to be covered uh, or designed to prevent injury from entrapment so that no little hands um, get stuck in there uh, and might um, be injured in that way. For restraint systems, we talked about some of the warnings associated with restraint systems that need to be on the products and the packaging. Uh, restraint systems are required on all products except carriages designed only for an infant. And that restraint system needs to include a waist and a crotch restraint, and it needs to meet additional performance specifications that are um, really lined out quite well in ASTM F833-15. For latching mechanisms that may exist uh, on your product, you need to make sure uh, that units that fold, so the 2D and 3D strollers that we talked about, need to have a latching device that prevents the unit from unintentional folding when placed in the manufacturer's recommended use position. And when we go through the product hazards, it's actually going to explain why this exists. Um, we're going to also touch on the uh, product hazard of scissoring, shearing, and pinching and kind of explain why this exists. But the requirement in terms of uh, performance is that the unit needs to be designed to prevent injury to the occupant when members or components rotate or move relative to one another. For toy accessories that may be included with the product, uh, those toy accessories need to meet the U.S. toy standard, which is ASTM F963. Uh, for cords or straps, uh, there is a limitation on loop perimeter length and free stretched lengths of cords and straps that originate within or extend into the occupant space. So if this is something that um, the child that's inside the stroller or carriage can access, then there are limitations on uh, the loop length and the stretched length of those cords and straps. So let's get into some of the performance requirements. Uh, and again, because we've got an hour today, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to highlight them and we're not going to walk through them because, um, again, this is a, uh, it's a copyright protected document and it's available for purchase. And I'll, uh, there is a hyperlink later um, that includes um, how to purchase that standard. So for performance requirements, and these are physical and mechanical, uh, there needs to be a parking brake to address the fall hazard. A static load uh, performance requirement exists that addresses tip overs and collapses. Uh, there's a stability requirement that addresses tip overs. There's a restraining system requirement that addresses a fall hazard. There are occupant retention requirements for carriages and convertible carriages and strollers that addresses falls. And a combination unit of a car seat on a stroller that addresses falls, tip overs, and collapses. And some more performance requirements. Uh, there's an impact test 
that addresses car seat detachment and ensures proper product integrity. There's a passive containment and foot opening requirement that addresses head and torso entrapment that can occur in those sorts of products. Uh, for wheel and swivel assemblies, if, those, uh, if you have a front swivel wheel, uh, this would apply to you and it addresses falls and tip overs. And then for car seats on a stroller or convertible carriage and stroller, there is a test that is intended to address head entrapment. So um, what do these requirements actually mean uh, in terms of you know, how to design a safer carriage or stroller or how to make sure that the ones that you are importing uh, into the US meet this requirement? Let's go through some of the product hazards and look for things uh, to look for. So uh, our first product hazard has to do with a collapsed stroller. And you see on the left-hand side of your screen, you have a little uh, cami doll. She's got red braided hair. She's in a little pink outfit. And you can see that the stroller has actually collapsed onto her. Um, the collapsed stroller issue is addressed by the new latching mechanisms testing. And it's meant to prevent that unintentional folding when the strollers uh, collapse. I guess I should also point out, and I probably should have done it earlier, is that the photos that we're showing of these products with the cami dolls inside are just for illustration purposes only. Uh, it's, not, it's definitely not meant to be picking on any products here. Um, wheel issues and fall hazards are another product hazard associated with strollers. The one you see on the top right is actually a jogging stroller. And you see that the front wheel is off of that jogging stroller. Uh, for wheel and swivel assemblies, there is now detachment testing that's required. There's also a warning label requirement on jogging strollers that tells you to lock the front swivel wheel if the front swivel wheel has the ability to be locked. Uh, sorry, if the front swivel wheel uh, has the ability um, to be locked before you start uh, jogging. Another product hazard, and I've, I've shown it in several instances here, are pinch points. Uh, on the top left, this is shown on the actual frame. You can see one of our testing engineers' finger. Um, that's at a, a point in the frame that could pose a pinch point for either an occupant or a caregiver that's using the stroller. Once it folds up, um, could cause a finger amputation or at least a finger injury. On the middle picture, you can see there is part of the frame that actually has a, uh, a divot that a finger uh, would easily fit into or part of a hand would easily fit, fit into that uh, poses a pinch point on that hinge. And then on the top right, you can see a picture of a canopy attached to a stroller, uh, and that's actually the hand of a little cami doll that shows that there is space in between the canopy frame and the actual closing uh, or the expansion mechanism on the canopy that could pose a pinch point. So this hazard, um, which is very present in um, strollers and carriages and definitely something you want to look out for in design, um, is addressed by the scissoring, shearing, and pinching testing requirements from ASTM F83315. Uh, and the testing there requires the use of testing probes, uh, a head and a torso testing probe that have specified measurements that are lined out uh, in that standard. And again, uh, a way to purchase that standard is going to be actually at the end of the webinar today. And uh, the last hazard that I'm going to address um, today, certainly not the only one, but I just wanted to highlight some of them, are an entrapment hazard. Here we've got it shown in three different um, examples. The first one is shown at a food tray uh, and you can see that the cami doll there has actually slipped down the stroller and has become entrapped with their head stuck between the food tray and the base of the stroller. The middle picture shows a car seat that's actually snapped into a frame. So this is a, a car seat attachment on a stroller uh, and in that case the cami doll um, you can see it's got brown big brown hair and it's wearing a blue outfit and you can see the legs actually dangling below the handle of the stroller. In this case, the, um, the occupant had tried to work its way out of the stroller and was entrapped between the stroller handle uh, and the frame of the car seat. And then finally, on the right-hand side of your screen, there is a cami doll that has slipped down. Um, this is a, um, a stroller with a, um, an adjustable grab bar, and the grab bar is in the lowest position, and the cami doll has become entrapped in that grab bar uh, at the neck. So to address this product hazard of entrapment, there is a passive containment or foot opening testing that's required uh, using those head and tor uh, torso probes.
that I referenced, which again, the dimensions of a head and torso probe are outlined in ASTM F83315. So now that we've gone through uh, all the testing requirements, let's take a look at um, how to find a lab that can conduct this testing for you. So at the outset, I guess I should say, uh, all children's products need to be tested by a CPSC accepted lab. So how do you find a CPSC accepted lab? We actually have a lab search page available via our website. Again, the hyperlink is um, clickable in your handout. Um, that is available online. It lists all the labs that are currently CPSC accepted all over the globe. You have the ability when you visit this site to narrow your search by region, which is by country, or by scope, which is a specific product um, testing. In this case, because we're talking about carriages and strollers, you could actually narrow the scope of the search to 16 CFR Part 1227, which is the safety standard for carriages and strollers. Again, incorporating by reference ASTM F83315. And if you click that link, it takes you to the ASTM page to purchase the standard. Um, I did check, uh, I guess it's been about a week or so ago, to see how many labs there were that do carriages and strollers testing. And there are about 30 uh, all across the globe, some in the United States, certainly a lot in China. Um, but there is a pretty extensive list if you're looking to find a testing lab or maybe even um, price compare between CPSC accepted labs. Uh, you can find the ones that do that testing on our lab search page. And for those of you that are having issues finding a lab uh, or getting in touch with a lab that might be listed, uh, there's a video tutorial available on our website. You can also get in touch uh, with our office and I'll give you the information on how to do that at the end of the webinar today. So uh, once you've located the lab and you know what needs to be done, how frequently do you need to conduct this testing? Uh, well, there's a periodic testing rule that applies to products that are in continuous production. And that's our regulation 16 CFR 1107.21. And the rule here is um, initial testing always has to be done. So before a carriage or stroller enters US commerce for the first time, uh, testing needs to be conducted uh, to all the applicable CPSC safety regulations. After that initial testing is done, periodic testing is required at a minimum of once per year, every two years if there's a production testing plan in place, or every three years if you're using a testing lab that's accredited to the ISO standard on your screen. The takeaway here is that the vast majority of manufacturers and importers must test children's products once per year. There is a caveat there uh, to the once per year um, you know, vast majority uh, applicability. And it is if you have a material change to your product. And we get questions on what is a material change? Is what I've done a material change? Well, what a material change is, is defined in our regulation 1107.23, and it actually appears right on your screen. Material change is one that a manufacturer makes to their product's design to the manufacturing process or to the source of component parts for the product, which a manufacturer knows, sorry, which a manufacturer exercising due care knows or should know could affect the product's ability to comply with the applicable children's product standard. So the important things to remember here are if you're making changes to the product design, the manufacturing process or the source of your component parts, uh, and you believe that that's going to impact the product's ability to comply with all the requirements that we've gone through today, that's considered a material change. And it means even if you just tested the carriage or stroller initially one month ago, it's time to retest again because you have a material change in effect. Uh, children's product certificates are required on all children's products. We abbreviate children's product certificates as a CPC. And we've got a pretty nice page on our website uh, available at cpsc.gov forward slash cpc. Again, you can follow the hyperlink in your handout uh, that answers. It actually has some frequently asked questions. It has two sample children's product certificates uh, available there that you can use as a guide. Uh, in terms of the availability of a children's product certificate or its counterpart for a non-children's product, a general certificate of conformity, not applicable today, but um, sometimes used interchangeably under the term certificate, um, three things to remember here. Certificates, uh, in your case, a children's product certificate needs to accompany each product or shipment of the product that's covered by the same certificate. A copy of the certificate must be furnished to each distributor or retailer of the product. However, there's no requirement to provide it to the ultimate consumer. And a copy of the certificate needs to be made available to our commission or, the, or Customs and Border Protection upon request. 
So three takeaways here, and they're in italics, are accompany each shipment into the U.S., be furnished to a distributor or retailer of the product, and provided to us or customs upon request. Uh, the good news here, for those of you that don't love the idea of um, putting children's product certificates on a paper or printed out thing into each box or carton that you know is coming into the U.S., is that electronic certificates have been approved by our commission as an acceptable means of complying with the children's product certificate requirement. But the caveat here is that electronic certificate must be created no later than the time of shipment or first distribution within the United States. So you can't go back after the fact and try to create a children's product certificate uh, that is not compliant with the children's product certificate requirements. All right, so let's walk through the seven sections of a children's product certificate because we, uh, we do get a lot of questions on this topic and uh, it's something that I think is uh, relatively easy for us to uh, help you with in the webinar. Uh, first question on a children's product certificate, and they all look the same, they all have the same seven questions, is a description of the product covered by the certificate. And here you want to be as detailed as you possibly can about your product. In section number two, you see A through E, and this should jog your memory because these are all the things that we've talked about actually today in terms of safety rules that apply to carriages and strollers. Uh, in A, we've got the total lead content. In B, we've got lead and paint and similar surface coatings, if that applies to your product because you have paint or a surface coating of some sort, or even screen printing, it would apply for screen printing. In C, we're talking about the ban on phthalates and toys and child care articles that are used to facilitate sleeping or eating. So it depends on whether or not this applies to your product based on how it's designed, intended for use, and marketed. And then the small parts regulation uh, from 1501 we talked about um, must be complied with on all carriages and strollers. And then finally, the physical and mechanical testing requirements and additionally the chemical testing requirements are incorporated into uh, our regulation 1227 and the ASTM standard F833.15 for carriages and strollers. So that's your section number two. It will list out uh, each of the applicable A through E. Uh, again, the only ones that may or may not apply to you are B, the lead and paint and surface coatings, depending on whether you have that on your product, and C, uh, the ban on phthalates and toys and child care articles, again, which depends on whether or not your product facilitates sleeping or eating and has plasticized parts. Number three is importer domestic manufacturer contact information. You'll want to include as much detail there as you can. Number four is contact info for the person that maintains your test records. Number five is the date and place of manufacture. Number six is the location of testing and date of test on which the certification is based. And number seven is the contact info of the testing laboratory that you've used. So uh, again, that's the children's product certificate uh, with the seven questions. And uh, our website is a great resource there in terms of providing samples of what they can look like. All right, so let's go through two recall examples that I think um, might be helpful because I, I always think it's a good idea to kind of learn from um, mistakes within the industry because I think um, that's the, you know, the best way uh, we as a group can kind of move forward. The first one is the Aria uh, child stroller. This was a recall that happened in December of 2016. The issues there were two. It was a laceration hazard and a fall hazard. Um, so the true hazard on this stroller, and it, uh, you can see that there were several models that were involved, was that there was a gap in the stroller's folding side hinge that could pinch a caregiver's hand during the unfolding, posing a laceration hazard. Uh, in addition, the stroller could unexpectedly, during use, uh, collapse or fold, just like uh, in the example of the folding stroller that we showed earlier, which posed an injury and a um, an injury potential and a fall hazard to a caregiver or a child. The remedy here was to replace the stroller outright. Uh, and again, um, you can see the recall date was a little under a year ago, December 20th of 2016. Uh, the next recall example that we've got is an up a baby recall uh, on strollers and rumble seats due to a choking hazard. Uh, and this impacted um, three different uh, up a baby products. The recall date here is July of 2015, and the hazard was that the strollers and rumble seats bumper bar posed a choking hazard when a child would bite the bumper bar and remove a piece of the foam covering. 
and you can see a picture of the foam bumper bar on the bottom uh, right hand side of your screen. The remedy here was repair uh, and again the recall date July 2015 uh, with the recall number shown on your screen. And I, I guess I should point out here that the uh, recall examples that we're using here are for educational purposes. We're not trying to call out any uh, manufacturers that might be attending today. Um, I, I use recall examples at the end of each of these webinars because it kind of shows um, that the industry, there's a few uh, hazards that are associated with these products. And I think learning from our peers is a, is a great way for us to learn as we move forward. Okay, so um, let me point out some business resources that I think might be uh, very useful to folks that are attending today, especially uh, importers or folks that might be new to uh, this product area, might be working in others. Uh, we have a new YouTube channel here at the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and I've got a hyperlink to it in your handouts, it's the CPSC YouTube channel. Um, hyperlink goes straight to the YouTube channel, and when you get there, you'll see the screen that appears uh, right now on your screen. And I've circled uh, the business education playlist uh, which is our webinar videos, and it's also other webinars that are available through the CPSC. I will tell you the Small Business Ombudsman Office has put together, um, this is our sixth webinar in our webinar series, so we've been doing these uh, for about seven or eight months. The topics that we've covered previously are a toy standard update for ASTM F96316, a uh, stuffed toys webinar that was just focused specifically on stuffed toys and the requirements there. Uh, we did one on cloth diapers, and then another one on sling carriers and soft infant and toddler carriers and their requirements. And then finally, the last one that we did, which was our most recent one before this one, uh, was in August. And it was actually on the mattresses requirements. Um, so for folks that would like to see other webinar uh, content that we've put together, you can find that on the business education playlist on the CPSC YouTube channel. And it's also just a fun um, it's actually a very educational site to go to, the YouTube channel. So you have the ability to go to the channel itself or our playlist uh, straight from the handout, uh, again, on the right-hand side of your toolbar. All right, lastly, a few more uh, business resources, and then we'll get to your questions that you've been submitting. By the way, thank you. I can, I can see that they're coming in, and I, uh, I do really appreciate everybody participating. Um, I've got my email on the screen please feel free to email me questions that you've got associated with this webinar. I also have on the screen a telephone number that rings at both my desk and my colleague Will's desk. That 7945 number is, is truly a number you can call and you can talk to somebody, a live person in the U.S. government. Um, we, if we're on another line or we're in a meeting, it'll go to voicemail. Leave us a voicemail and we will call you back as soon as we can. We do try to be really responsive. Uh, we do have a Twitter feed uh, if you are so inclined. Um, we're on Twitter and our handle is at CPSC Small Biz. Uh, it's a great way to track things like this webinar, uh, public comment periods that might be open, uh, or things happening at the CPSC in terms of a commission hearing uh, that the public can attend online or in person. Or if we're going to speak at an event, um, I'm going to post it on our Twitter feed so you can follow us at CPSC Small Biz. I've got the lab search page link uh, on your screen and I also wanted to highlight the regulatory robot on the bottom right hand side of the screen uh, and that is the hyperlink straight to the robot. The robot is something we're pretty proud of here in the SBO. It's an interactive bot that will ask you a series of questions to try to figure out what type of product you're making uh, and help you um, know what the requirements are on you. And lastly, something that I didn't touch on uh, throughout the webinar, but I think is also a good resource, is our Strollers and Carriages business education page. And that's a live link um, right there available in your handout to the Strollers and Carriages uh, business page. So uh, one last resource that I wanted to point out is our, uh, it tries to be, I try to make it monthly, although I did um, fall down on duties a little bit and <laughs> went about two months without a newsletter. I did just send one out at the end of October. Uh, we've got a monthly newsletter here at the Small Business Ombudsman's Office that is a great way to stay up to date on webinars that we're going to offer. If you'd like to sign up for our newsletter, you can do so by visiting cpsc.gov forward slash email. Again, the hyperlink is available in your handout. Uh, and you'll need, there's going to be a long list of newsletters you can sign up for. You can absolutely sign up for as many as you want. But if you want to make sure you sign up for hours, you need to make sure you select Small Business Ombudsman Updates. So with all that being said, 
Uh, thank you so much for attending today. Again, I'm Shelby Mathis. I'm the Small Business Ombudsman at the Consumer Product Safety Commission. We've loved having you attend today. You've got my email, you've got our phone number, and please don't hesitate to get in touch if we can be a further assistance to you or your business. Thank you.